This is a production of Speed Sport, America's motorsports authority since 1934. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Geico 15-Minute Moto Show. I'm your host, Ralph Shaheen. We're here at West Coast Choppers in Austin, Texas, with my good buddy, Jesse James. Jesse, when I think of you, I think of artist, craftsman, metal worker, custom bike builder, firearms maker, culinary designer. What do you consider yourself? I don't know, just broke ass that wants cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, I have to learn how to make everything myself because I'm, I guess, too much of a cheap ass to buy some things. Or, or not really. Like, I have a lot of expensive stuff, but I think stuff that I want doesn't exist, so I have to learn how to create it. And In, in all of that, where does Custom Bike Builder now rank? Because that's really where everybody got to know you at. Well, it, I mean, you were around in the early 2000s, like when stuff was really crazy, you know, we'd be doing like 10 bikes a month. Now we do about three a year. And I kind of pick and choose my jobs and only do the stuff that I want to do, you know, and stuff that, you know, we were taking everybody's money back in the day and trying to crank as much stuff out as we could. And now, and at the same time, the bikes that I built for myself, like the copper bike and different they were always way better than the kind of customers bikes because I didn't really care about time or amount of labor or what it costs to do it so now every bike I build is kind of like that you know and, and it's smaller scale I mean I'll still motorcycles are still first and foremost in my life and I live in an amazing place where the riding is just awesome how much has the request of the customer especially like with the bikes um, we, you know, bikes tend to go through a lot of fads, um, since I've known you, obviously the, the big, long old school style chopper was a huge rage for quite a while. Uh, now we got the baggers with the huge front wheels and then performance baggers are coming around. What do you see from the customer in the custom bike world these days? Uh, most of the customers still the biggest majority. They like the stuff I did 20 years ago. I want a bike just like that. And. I just refuse to buckle that. I'm always trying to push forward. And so a lot of, we have a new chassis called a swing arm dominator that's, you know, 17 inch wheels, big brakes, fuel injected motor, six speed, like standard riding position with your feet tucked underneath you, but still a custom Harley, you know, and that, I love stuff that looks custom, but performs like a modern bike, you know. That's, that's interesting. So, and plus I've learned like, Sometimes the more customer input you have, the worse <laughs> the bike comes out. <laughs> yeah. You know? How, how much of that has changed for you with age, too? Because, you know, as, as we all get older, uh, we all look for different things in, yeah, in our riding comfort and stuff, right? Guys are eight, definitely aging out of riding ridges, but I have a new one right there, and one I'm building rigid for myself, and it's, I, I still like it better. I still love to ride a rigid. You know, it's just after 100, 120 miles, you're ready to get off for a minute. <laughs> but if it's set up right and it's a good balanced bike and good front suspension that doesn't counteract having no suspension, it's they're really fun to ride. So, yeah. Is, is that still the biggest thrill for you just to be out the pure freedom of riding? Yeah, riding or taking one of my hot rods out. It's just here. You're never in L.A. You're never not around people or other cars, which is fine if you're building something you want to show it off, but man, it's something cool about taking my 32 Ford Roadster and just banging gears down some country road and never seeing another person in another car, maybe see some cows, yeah. but that's it, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's something, learning to fall in, it didn't take too much to fall in love with that kind of thing. What was the original inspirations for you with your early designs? Was there a particular, uh, customizer or builder or artist that influenced you in the when i started in the early 90s most motorcycle customizing and the fabrication aspect of it was really terrible but i always had a keen eye for coach building a hand fabricated aluminum and steel and lightweight beautiful kind of 30s 40s 50s style of fab work and then when i worked at went to work at hot rods by boyd it like 
made my head explode. Like I thought I was doing really good work in my garage. Then I went to Boyd's and I'm just like, I wanted to throw a rock at everything I built before then. But Boyd changed my life and I adapted that coach building, really expensive, labor intensive way of making things into motorcycles, which I don't really think existed before that on the level I did it in and like still do it in, so. Yeah, have you gotten your head around how much you influenced the custom bike world specifically? Probably mostly in bad ways. <laughs> no, no, but no, seriously. I mean, you know, you really, I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on and there was a lot of really cool stuff, but when you hit the ground running with everything you were doing, uh, it changed overnight yeah. and went in a different direction. Um, do you, have you ever really thought about, man, I, I've left a mark here? I don't know. I don't really. I'm always just thinking about what I'm working on that day or stuff. Do you have pride that in that, though? Are you proud of that? Uh, I think the biggest pride is like a lot of shops will build like one cool bike in the history of the shop. And they'll take that one cool badass bike they did to every show for years after that. Just like one. And I never wanted to be that guy. I just want to like keep punching, you know, keep like. Like, oh, you like that one? Boom, look at this one. Yeah. And then 500 more behind it over 25 years. You know, that's what I want to do. I want to keep pushing myself and, like, always give something, show what we're, our potential, you know, keep pushing the envelope. Yeah. Hey, is there one that you've done that you look back on, you go, that might be, is it the, like the copper bike? That uh, might be. The copper bike is probably the most famous, but I look at it now 20 years after I built it and there's a bunch of stuff that I wouldn't have done or I would change or do different Well, is that because you've changed yeah, as an artist? Yeah, my, nothing, nothing wrong with the No, it's a good bike. Yeah. I rode it across Mexico, but I think some stuff maybe wasn't that difficult for me, you know? Yeah. And now pushing, you know, more difficult processes and pouring more labor into it. I still built when I was 21 or 22 the first custom bike I built was a 1950 shovel pan <clears throat> and I built it and I I when my do my first wife was pregnant I built it and sold it to pay for all the prenatal care because I didn't have insurance or anything and yeah. it went to Japan somewhere and I've never been able to find it oh man that's the one that got away for sure uh, and it's out there somewhere somewhere yeah and it was pretty and it really has this, it set the tone for everything that I built still, yeah. you know. What's your take on the current custom bike scene? Do you, do you like where it's at or do you think it's gone away from where it should be? I think the in industry's definitely purged itself, especially the custom Harley industry. <clears throat> like a lot of shops are gone. Everybody jumped on that bagger craze, not performance bagger, more custom stuff. And I think that you know, one, they're not building a bike. You're taking an existing bike and building it. We're building a bike from scratch, building it tailor-made to someone. And I think that's what's kept us in business. You know, so many other places have, that jumped on the trend in the early 2000s. And then as soon as it wasn't, they didn't love it because as soon as money went away from it, they're gone. You know, me, I don't, I don't, I run this shop different than I did 20 years ago, where 20 years ago was all about profit and growth. Now, I just want to keep everything in the black. So if we don't lose money, and I still get to do what I do every day, I'm happy. Yeah. You know, that to me is I'm doing what I want to do. Yeah. Gun, gun business, culinary business is, is good profit, good making money, but bike business and car business so labor intensive and so much expensive processes in it that I just don't, I give up trying to make money. <laughs> and I'm just like, ah, it's never gonna happen, but this is what I wanna do, so yeah. this is what I'm doing, and try to keep myself healthy and focused and so I could do it as long as I can. I think most people, I see business owners, you know, you've seen it over the years. I hate to use Perry Sands as an example, but like, you know, once he gets established, the product lands on, you know, autopilot, machine shop and everything, then they start taking pictures in their office on the cell phone, on the phone, you know, with the fake waterfall behind them. Like, that, that's, they, 
the labor and the drive part goes away because yeah. it's just a money income that, to them. And like, I hate that because Perry was such an innovative guy and he shared a warehouse with my dad when I was a kid and just pushed awesome stuff. And it's like, man, I just want to, I want to go to my grave doing awesome things. I don't want to ever get to a point, you know, I want to be Gene, Gene Winfield. I want to be in my nineties still cutting, chopping tops and painting stuff, you know? Yeah. That, it, so as you see that, does the customer help keep you alive that way? Because customer comes in with an idea or they just come to you, hand you a bag of money and say, make me a Jesse James bike. The customers fuel it for sure, because it's such a personal relationship between myself and my customers that like, all like, like if I hate you, I can't physically make my hands work on your stuff. I could just, it puts this mental block, but if I love a customer and we hang out and like some of our customers, one of our good customers came down with us to the Texas mile just to watch. And his, I just love being around that dude and such a good dude. So when it comes to working on his stuff, like I'm going to push myself extra hard to like blow that guy away, you know, and that it's kind of a, a you know, it just, everything works together in that triangle, the shop, myself and the customers, you know. Is there ever been a customer that's come to you with an idea that you just went, I don't know if we can do that? All the time. <laughs> really? Yeah. I say no more than anybody, I think, because people can see only what's out there, what's on Instagram or what they can Google. They can't see what's in my head or what our capabilities are. You know, you can't see a capability. You can only see the stuff we did before, but we're always pushing and learning and going for the next thing, you know. Is there uh, the Choppers for Life logo? You still live by that mantra? I think so. I'll always have a rigid, always, I got like one, two, three, four, <laughs> five. Five of those bikes are mine and they're all rigids. What, what is it about that that just hit hit something in your soul i don't know the same thing about guys out at moto america riding an uncorked r1 most people would see that and go "Ooh, that's scary i would never do 190 down yeah, the straightaway yeah. same thing with the rigid they see no suspension little c and like oh that just hurts my back by looking at it <laughs> you know yeah, like yeah. that stuff makes me want to do it more yeah, that's, that's pretty cool so you've done a lot of amazing rides like across mexico on the the copper bike and so forth. Top of the Arctic Circle. Yeah, is there one of those that you're dreaming of? Uh, I got a offer to go from being, from rock and roll touring with bands, uh, the surgeon who's Putin's bodyguard, Yeah. used to work for me in Germany. He was like an assistant on some tours. And no he, way. I have an open invitation to go ride across Russia with him and his, the Night Wolves is their bike club. Right. And I just thought that would be really cool because as much rhetoric, rhetoric, rhetoric there is and everything, yeah. you've been all over the world and like people are the same everywhere. It's probably yeah. mostly BS and like, I think it would be fun. You what know? would you take for that? A rigid, you'd have to do it. So if you're gonna go ride across would probably, Russia, I'd would it be an all American rigid type deal? I don't know what the accommodations are where we'd stay. So I'd probably have to take something. I could pack some stuff on. I'd probably take one of the new swing arm dominators. So yeah, but would it be a red, white and blue type deal? Would it be all Texas? Nah, it'd be my style. It'd be your flames. <laughs> okay. So I guess that's a really good question. If, if you were to, if you weren't Jesse James, but you were to explain to somebody what a Jesse James style bike is what is it in your mind it's got to have every it's got to have so much stuff stripped away no covers no extra anything it's got to look like it won't run there's so it's so sparse and spindly and lack of clutter that it probably doesn't work that's to me this is a jesse james bike but it works perfect yep yep even better because you don't have to worry about all that crap falling off it's perfect <laughs> Nice. Okay, so what's the thing that is still back in your mind that, as you say, one of these days, I'm going to make a what? Is it a gun? Is it a knife? 
Is it a bike that's still out there in your brain? I have a really great design for a stress member sport bike. I don't think anybody's ever successfully molded the V-twin world with a correct like 54 inch wheelbase, perfect CG balanced sport bike. Like Britain, uh, yeah. Britain came the closest. Like he really did it. Yeah. But I think like choppers are cool and like, yeah, we can make bikes that ride great and everything, but I still want to push progress and that. I have this really great design in the back of my head that I really want to do one day. I mean, I just think it would be, to me, the pinnacle of motorcycles is just taking it to like Isle of Man or Daytona or something like that, or, you know, one of the club races in England or Ireland, you know, and really doing a hand-built bike that competes, you know, and that, to, that pushes the limit of the function. Yeah. You and know. you would ride it? No. No, I'm too, I'm too big. <laughs> No, I would get, actually, I talked to John McGinnis, yeah. and he said he'll ride whatever I build for free. He said he would do it anytime I want. That I want to say. And he would be the perfect guy for it, you know, like. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Thanks, Jesse. Really appreciate it, brother. Good seeing you. We sure hope you've enjoyed this edition of the GEICO 15-Minute Moto Show.